All right, welcome to how they figured out the speed of EMR. And this was definitely something to figure out because originally it was thought that light traveled instantaneously because, you know, you light fire and all of a sudden you see light. There doesn't seem to be a time lag in between those two things. And that's because it's such a short distance and light does travel just so incredibly fast. But as we do know, Light does have a speed. It does take time to travel, and the further distances you get, the more you realize this. So, a uh, guy named Galileo, maybe you've heard of him, he was the first who kind of came up with a method of measuring the speed of light, and it was a horrible, horrible uh, method. Like, it was never going to work, but it was still really important because he's the first to go... Okay, I want to come up with a method. I want to see if this is truly instantaneous or not, or if it does take time to travel. And that was what was so important about this. So basically what he did is he had one assistant right here, his first assistant right there. He opens a lat lantern shutter. And then on a distant hilltop, he has a second assistant over here. And when he sees the light from the first assistant, he opens his shutter, lantern shutter. And then Galileo's down here, and he's measuring the time between the opening of the first lantern. So, few problems here. Well, Galileo's down here, so he's just looking at this from a totally different viewpoint. So also have to, has to keep in mind the time it takes for light to travel to his eyes. Secondly, our human reaction time is usually... Uh, somewhere in between a quarter and half a second, which if you're just measuring from two hilltops, um, yeah, light's going to travel faster than that. So our reaction time would actually be longer than the time it takes for the light to travel across this distance. And so therefore we cannot get an accurate reading of light and its speed whatsoever. So it was really not something that was ever going to work, but it was still really insistent or but it was still really important in the fact that it started people on this question, what is the speed of light? Does light have a speed or is it uh instantaneous? So that's why that was still a very important uh experiment, right? But it was absolutely not accurate whatsoever. Uh, so this guy, Olus Romer, came around and he was really interested in the measurements of Jupiter's moon, Io. It's literally just like Io. I know that's how it's spelt, but it's also how it said, Io. And we found these irregularities in the period of Io, depending on uh, if Earth was moving away from Jupiter or moving towards. So whether Earth was farther away from the moon or closer to the moon, he noticed these irregular... Um, discrepancies between how much time it takes or sorry between the time of the day that he could see Io. Uh, so he actually didn't interpret it correctly. He was like, oh, I just think it's a change in motion of the moon around Jupiter, um, which doesn't really make sense if you know anything about orbitals, which maybe he didn't. So that's okay. But it's, basically, this is what's happening is you have when the Earth is at a closer distance to Jupiter, obviously the moon here is going to show up in a different place. But when the Earth is farther away, the moon is going to show up uh, at a different time because obviously it's taking that light longer to reach the Earth at that point. So this guy named Christian Huygens, I don't know if I'm saying that right, uh, but he's actually the one that came along. He looked at Romer's um, data and he actually interpreted it correctly so Romer didn't he he had no idea what was going on he collected some really good data but he didn't actually know what was going on he thought it was a irregularity with uh the moon around Jupiter which we know it doesn't happen right that just does not happen so he interpreted it correctly and said oh well it's probably because light's taking longer to travel to us across a longer distance and then he was actually able to make an approximate calculation of c there which is pretty cool he was still pretty off but he definitely got closer than anybody had at that time which is really cool um and so they specifically used the time that io was going into an eclipse with jupiter to figure out um 
what exact time this was happening at because obviously you need IO in a very specific place. You need to know when it's going to be in a specific place. So we they used uh, IO's eclipses to measure the speed of light. So what time are IO's eclipses happening? What's the distance that the light is traveling? Let's take that distance, divide it by um, the time that it's at and the di difference between the times. And um, they were able to approximate a calculation there. And then this guy, so that was good for a hundred years or so. This guy named Leon Foucault came along and he uses this crazy slotted wheel and mirror system. Um, and it's like not a bad idea, but he just really overcomplicated it because for light to be observed, the wheel has to make a complete turn, which again, light travels really, 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 really fast. So to make a wheel make a complete turn in like fractions of a second is really, really difficult, right? So this was his setup and it just looks a big mess, honestly. So don't worry too much about really understanding what's going on here. We had like three lenses with the setup, which is kind of crazy. So this is the tooth wheel where if light goes through at one point, it's got to make, so if it went through at that point, it's just got to make a full turn back to that point, which is insane. Uh, and then he's thinking, well, the light, if it goes here and then it's bended by the lens, it goes down like this and then it's bended by the lens and it goes straight across and goes across eight kilometers, which is good because he at least went a little bit farther than everybody else, but than Galileo at least, but still not enough uh, time. And then it reaches a mirror and it bounces off and it goes here and then it's bent by a lens again and then is bent by another lens and then it has to go through this toothed wheel. So at this point, this will have to made, have made a complete turn if it doesn't, then it'll bounce off one of these thingies and then, yeah, sucks. And then it goes here and it sees a beam splitter and then hopefully goes down here to an observer. This is an eye, by the way. We always use that kind of thing for an observer. Um, yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's just too complicated and we can do something very similar in a much more beautiful um, way. And that is where Michelson comes in. Michelson really perfected this. He actually dedicated his life to being able to measure the speed of light and to doing this uh, experiment over and over and over and over again over like years. So he really perfected the method and he got a really close calculation of C, which is pretty fantastic if you think about it. Without any computers or anything like that, he was able to do this. So what did he do? Here's the setup. He had this rotating mirror. So this is a rotating mirror where each side is, has a nice reflective surface. Okay. And so then the light from here can go up and bounce off of there and go this direction. And then 35 and a half kilometers away. So he did this on two mountaintops. So he went from one mountaintop to another mountaintop. And so then it would, travel that full 35 and a half kilometers away and then the light would hit the fixed mirror here and bounce off and then it would go back and we'll go over this but it'll bounce back at the same angle actually which is nice okay and then in that time so that remember light travels really fast so that will happen in fractions 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 of a second so in that time if you have this mirror this eight-sided mirror making just the perfect amount of revolutions per second. At this point where it bounces back, the mirror will have made one-eighth of a rotation. So the mirror didn't have to make a full spin. It only had to make a perfect one-eighth of a rotation. And if it didn't make a one-eighth of a rotation, if it was a little bit off, then this observer over here wouldn't see it because the light would bounce, you know, that way or that way or that way or something like that. So that's how they were able to tell if it was making a perfect one eighth of a revolution. And then they can take the revolutions per second here and divide it by eight to see how long it takes just to do an eighth of rotation um, and be able to then use distance over time to get the speed of light, which was 
good. And he, again, he did this over and over and over. Remember in experiments, us crazy science teachers always make you do like three or four trials. So think about hundreds of trials and that's what he did. He dedicated his whole life to it. Um, there, there was once like famously an earthquake and they moved a little bit and he had to like completely reset up his whole thing and take new measurements and um, it was a lot of work. So he definitely dedicated a good chunk of his life to this. And he figured out a really good uh, approximation of C. So that's pretty awesome. So these are just all the words saying what I just said. <laughs> so uh, you can write them down if you want to. But uh, yeah, that's what he did. So what have we figured out since then? The speed of light is a, in a vacuum is a constant, uh, which I'm sure you already know. So light is always going to travel at 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in a vacuum. And really in air, it's not going to go much slower. It's going so like slightly slower that we don't actually account for that. And then a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but a lot of people say this and they don't even really know what it means. So for example, um, if I say that a star is 2,500 light years away, that means it would take its light 2,500 years to reach us, which is why so many of the stars in the sky that we look at are just like imprints of dead stars because they're really stars, you know, thousands of years ago at this point. Um, so we don't actually know necessarily what's going on in those stars right now. We just know what's going on in those stars thousands of years ago because they're so far away and their light is just reading, reaching us now. All right, so let's do one example of how Michelson would have calculated the speed of light using his eight-sided mirror system. So uh, he obtained an image when the mirror was rotating at 3.7 times 10 to the four RPMs. What's that? That's rotations per minute. Obviously we always want seconds, so we are gonna have to change that. So we got to figure out what's the speed of light if the fixed mirror is placed 30 kilometers from the rotating mirror. All right, so this guy is a measure of frequency, right? And we know frequency is the number of cycles per unit time. Okay, so if we're looking at this 3.70 times 10 to the 4 rotations per minute, oops, again, we want to know what's happening per unit time. Well, that's happening per minute, obviously, so we could put one minute down there, but we actually want seconds, so I'm going to say that's equal to... Uh, Per 60 seconds because we never want things you know we don't want meters per minute for our speed of light we want meters per second okay and of course what's happening with the actual rotation well we know it's not making a full rotation the mirror eight-sided mirror system it's making one eighth of a rotation per that unit time and that's the time that we have to figure out we have to figure out what the heck is this unit time that it takes to make one eighth of a rotation in seconds with regard to uh, its frequency, the frequency that we're given. So if I want to figure out time here, I can just kind of rearrange this equation that I made. And the time it takes to make one eighth of a rotation, you should be able to do one eighth times 60 divided by that 3.70 times 10 to the 4 rotations per minute. So how long is that? That is 2.03 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. Okay, so that's how long it just takes to, oops, that's long, how long it just takes to do one eighth of a rotation and that is what we need to be able to calculate the speed of light because we need to know how long is it taking to go that 30 kilometers and back. I also just said something really important there. It's going 30 kilometers right? But 
it's also coming back. So that's really, really important in these questions. Often you're going to have to take that distance and multiply it by two. So now what do we do? Now we get to go back to using the easiest, most wonderful, most basic equation in physics history. The thing that I always tell you not to use, well, now we actually don't have acceleration. Speed of light is constant. Uh, so it basically accelerates instantaneously. So yay, we can go back to using this annoying formula that's only applicable in few situations. But this is one of the few. So now it gets really nice and easy. So it's just distance over time. So our distance is 2 times 30 kilometers, because again, it's going there and back. And then we divide that by the time that we got, 2.03 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. And what do we get? It's We get that it is traveling at 2.96 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is pretty close. It's really not that far off. I believe we're at something like 2.98 or 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, yeah, but it just basically keeps rounding up to 3, so we that's what we do. But it's still pretty darn close, which is awesome. And so this is what Michelson did just millions, well, probably not millions of times, but hundreds, possibly thousands of times throughout his lifetime and just kept doing this. And uh, yeah found the average so thank you to him obviously we've gotten a more uh accurate version now because of computers um but it, he still really wasn't far off from the actual value which is pretty awesome so there we go that's a michelson question you will be seeing that again so make sure you know how to do that kind of question otherwise i hope you guys enjoyed this i'm enjoying learning about EMR, it's definitely an, uh, one of my favorite uh, units, except for Atomic, which is coming next. So, uh, yeah, hope you guys have a great day.